I'm so glad that you guys joined us. It's going to be a very exciting show today. Just to catch up, you know, we've, um, I think this is now going on week seven that we've been live streaming here from Facebook. And it's been really great to see all your folks' comments come through. You know, I was reading this morning, uh, by the way, for you Star Wars fans, today is May 4th, which is Star Wars Day, and it is May the 4th be with you, for those of you who like to follow the whole chronicles of the Star Wars continuum. Um, but one of the things I was reading today was really interesting, was talking about how life will never be the same after this coronavirus has hit the entire planet at the exact same time. And we've all been doing the exact same thing globally, which is being uh, sheltering in place and being six feet apart, wearing masks. And wow, who would have ever thought in our lifetime we would experience something like this on a global level? But there were some interesting questions talking about how we were going to change our behaviors. And I just want to throw it out because I know you guys, uh, you, you type in questions and comments and that kind of thing. So maybe you can do me a favor and answer some of these as we go through the show. But the first thing was a big question is, will you be traveling? And if you will be traveling, will you be traveling abroad? It'll be very interesting to see if we all, you know, jump on the next plane as soon as we can and, and take off to another country. Another question was, um, how will you commerce? Will you be doing more things online or will you be going out? So because you can get out and going into your favorite places to shop or will Amazon be your go to? Um, how about will any of you be jumping on a cruise ship anytime soon? I thought that was interesting. I bet there will be some deals to be had if you are adventuresome and you want to jump on that cruise. I've always wanted to go to Alaska um, and this might be the time to do it, but I don't know. I might be a little bit hesitant. Um, will you be adding to your mask collection? So I have three masks so far. My mom just made me another one and I might have to start, you know, coordinating with my fashion. Um, this one I thought was really funny. Will you be joining AA after all of this? because I know a lot of us have had many Saturday nights in a row. Um, will you be going to couples therapy? I thought that was an interesting one. And then finally, will you be sending your kids off to boarding school? So those are all some very interesting questions. Maybe if you get a chance, go ahead and put those in the live stream. Some of them obviously are tongue in cheek and funny, but you get the point. Life is gonna be different. And so it'll be really interesting to see how things unfold. In the meantime, we are going to continue to be here in this gallery in Solana Beach. We have our next big show coming up for the artist Michael Floor, and we are crossing our fingers that everything will go as planned. But that's going to be June 22nd or 20th and 21st. And then our big shindigs coming up July 25th, and we're going to have our big 25 year anniversary show. So make sure you mark those on your calendar. And now we have somebody really special who I met, gosh, it must be, Isabella's 13, so it must be about 14 years ago because she came along about a year after, and that is Doug Hill from Hill Family um, Estates. It's a winery up in the Napa Valley. I was completely blown away when I went up there because this guy's passion for wine and winemaking and for sharing wine is like nobody else I've met. And I went to several different wineries up there, including um, Heidi Barrett's winery of the uh, famed Screaming Eagle and Monta, Monta Chantelena, I think it's called. He's going to correct me here when he gets on there. But let me see if I can get these guys to come on. I'm so excited to have them live streaming all the way from Napa. So let's see if we can bring them into the show here. And there they are. Hi, Doug. How are you? I'm doing great. How are you doing? Good. It's good to see you after all these years. And I can't believe it seems like a blink of an eye since I was up at your beautiful estate there. It's so amazing. It really does. I can't, I, I can't believe time has flown by that quickly. Yeah, it's, it's incredible. So how's it been for you winemakers? up you know where you are i know we've all been shut inside i i've been following you guys on facebook at least you can go outside 
Yeah, yeah, we, we can. So, I mean, it, it varies depending what aspect of the wine business you're working in. And certainly our tasting room is shut down. We had just purchased a, a new little winery facility that we're getting up and going when this whole thing hits. So we're not able to host any guests there right now, but we're hoping soon. As far as the vineyard part of the business, though, this is uh, we're in a protected category. You know, the plants keep growing and we, we need to be out doing things. And uh, so we, we've gone through uh, the early bud push in March and April. And uh, we had to do a little frost protection this year. There were some big frosts that hit down in Carneros this year and a little bit of crop loss in some vineyards. Oh, no. Yeah, uh, I will say, though, it was a very, I know for you folks down there, I think you had a wetter than normal right. winter. Yeah, we did, which, which we needed. Yeah, well, we, we could have used a little bit of that because we, we have had a drier than normal winter. So we're practically in drought conditions, although we did have some rainfall this winter. Uh, but things dried out and we had so many work days in the spring and winter, we were all caught up about the time shelter in place actually occurred for us. So uh, for a, a number of our crew, we had a, a short little layoff for a couple mm -hmm. of weeks so that we could come back or during that time get things organized and make sure that what we offered was right up to par with what we needed to do uh, with regard to health and safety. And Leslie, my wife, is right beside me here, and she might add a little bit about that. We just got to keep everybody safe. They say the outdoors is the best place to be right now, right? So right. Um, we've got everybody out there working in separate rows, so they're keeping their distance, and they've got their face protection on, and we've got lots of sanitation going on out there. So. As Doug said, the vines don't wait when they need to, when they need care, they need care. So, you know, it's still, it's still farming. <laughs> so walk us through guys, you know, I mean, I've been, I've been out, I've seen your, your space. I don't think that the, that the um, grapes were, I think they were kind of fallow at that point. I can't remember what year we came, but I don't remember seeing any of the grapes. So what, how, how does the season work? Like when do you, I, we kind of all know crush is like October. And then after that, what happens to get it to the place where you can harvest the grapes? And what happens if you have like a frost like that? Does that affect the vintage and the way it tastes? Yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll let you take this. One. <laughs> so we're actually in our busy season right now from a winemaking perspective. You know, I think that September, October are really crazy. But from a growing perspective, this is game on. So all through January, February, March, we're pruning, we're fertilizing, here in trellis, but we're kind of just waiting. Be begin to plant. We're, be we're planting. planting, you know, replanting, but it's, it's kind of a bit of a waiting game. But then depending on what happens with your spring weather, you've got bud break. We had a really warm March up here. It was like almost... Did I lose oh, you? Okay. In a cold March or a warm March and a cold April. Anyhow, the plants yeah. were really confused this year. Yeah, so good. they started growing and then they stopped growing and then they started growing. And then last week we finally hit like 84 for five days in a row. And they probably doubled in size in about seven days time. So, so. The, the way these things happen, uh, our, what we do, our tasks in the field are very much influenced by the weather. And so we were hoping to that, you know, once it warmed up, it would stay warm, but no. April okay. turned very cool. The buds had just begun to push, but we weren't ready for suckering, which is a, a big program, going through and removing various shoots and only leaving the ones that we want on the trellis. So, so it's been, uh, it's a little bit wait and see, and then uh, wait, 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 and then all of a sudden we Oops. should have done it yesterday. <laughs> that sounds, it sounds like the, the grapes are very in tune with what's going on in, uh, at least in the United States, because that's exactly what's happening here. You can go to beaches. No, you can't. Um, maybe. Okay. You can, but you know, you got to wear the mask and then, you know, so yeah, they're, they're right on. They got their antenna up there. Right. They're feeling us. <laughs> They're feeling us for sure. <laughs> they are. So, so I think Leslie kind of uh, laid it out for you on the, the, I would say the times where it is less important that the vineyards have our care and attention are probably right after harvest through about uh, mid January. And those are frequently our times that we can get away. That's, that's so amazing that you guys are, 
you know, still pushing forward and that you're allowed to, because we would certainly hate to not have any of your wine at the end of the, at the, end of the season, right? We know you've all been drinking a lot during- uh, We summer. have been, boy, I'm guilty as charged. Right. <laughs> and I got the last two bottles from your guys, um, um, vintage uh, from the Vons the other day, you were cleared out, so you're doing something right. Oh, fantastic. Oh, good, wonderful. Yeah, you know, um, uh, my daughter Carly lives in Little Italy. Okay. So she's been, she, yeah, she's been down there for what fifteen years plus, I think. Yeah. So she's seen a lot of changes in Little Italy yeah. too. That place has just exploded overnight. I wish I would have opened a gallery oh. there now. In hindsight. Uh -huh. Oh yeah. Yeah, she she had me on at eight p.m. the other evening for the howling. Oh yes. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, from the balcony. <laughs> yeah, from the balcony. Yeah. I think she's That's on the great. fifth floor. I, I love that. So tell us about what what wines are you creating right now and what are you known for? Well, wow, what wines are we creating? We, we like to get dabble in a whole lot of things. And, and uh, one of the issues is one of the main uh, uh, methods that we wanted to sell wine from the beginning was uh, basically direct to the consumer. And we are in both markets. We sell uh, some direct to the consumer. We have a few states that we're in. Um, but we just thought that was the niche we wanted to hit as much as possible. So in order to do that, if we want to, we have an established wine club and we, we like to have at least a dozen different wines for people, uh, wine club members to try during the season. So this is a range of things, everything from Albarino to Zinfandel. And, wow. and uh, Albarino, I got to say, is one of my favorites. It, it comes from uh, Galicia and parts of Portugal. So it's a white varietal that grows in cool regions there, creates a very fresh wine. I guess you could call it more like a Sauvignon Blanc in the style that it's made. But it's just a delicious, fresh, beautiful wine. Uh, which is nice for sipping when you come home from work or on a Saturday afternoon, whatever you're doing. Um, it, it goes from there to various, uh, we have three to four Sauvignon Blancs that we make every year. From a, a fresher stainless steel fermented to a, a neutral oak barrel fermented or stainless steel barrel fermented. Uh, to a, a vineyard designated Atlas Peak wine that's made more in a style of a Chardonnay. Uh, barrel fermented in some new oak barrels. So, so those those happen. Then we have a couple of well, three, you know, a couple of Chardonnays. Uh, moving into the reds, we do Merlot. We do Malbec. I already mentioned. Zip. I love your Merlot, by the way. It's amazing. Thank you. I've had a you know I had the experience. I was I was actually the largest farmer of Merlot in the Napa Valley about the time the sideways hit. So I had, a, <laughs> and our, our brand really, when we established it, I had so much experience growing really good Merlot in the Southern end of the Valley that we were going to make Merlot our flagship, but we, we quickly turned that around when sideways hit. And although we, we did come out with the Merlot, we also came out with a Bordeaux blend with uh, Merlot Cabernet Sauvignon and Cabernet Franc, and and so, anyway, we've we've um, uh, we we have we have made it through those those times, and still do do Merlots and do them well. But so we, we have actually over fifteen different wines. Our Cabernets have really come on. We have some vineyard designated Cabernets from different vineyards that we've acquired, and uh, it's it's just really been a lot of fun. As you know, it's my passion, and my yeah. palate is out there and mm -hmm. finding. For, for about 20 years, it was finding a new location in the Napa Valley to grow a new vineyard and finding it and uh, either negotiating with the owner of the property or purchasing the property in some situations. But we leased a lot of properties. We would plant them, set up a well, set up the trellis and make something that we thought could be great from that area. Well, you, you certainly have done that. I knew that we were on to something when I had come up with that artist that did that painting of you, Christopher M. And at that time, he also was um, painting famous chefs. And we went to French Laundry and met with Thomas Keller. 
And I had mentioned to him that we were going to your winery and he gave you a very strong endorsement. So I thought we were in for a real treat. Well, there, there, still there's a little bit of pro, organic produce from our garden that goes to the French laundry. Yeah, that, that was amazing. And yeah. that he grows his own snails in the backyard and that I'm sure you, you guys have been over there to see that. Oh, oh yeah. And because Peter Jacobson was his, his real first farmer before he got, before he set up farming for himself. Right. And Peter, our next door neighbor was the farmer for the French laundry frequently. And, and he was the guy who I think created the, uh, the uh, free range organic nails. Yeah. <laughs> hey, Richard, is everybody yeah. like that painting we were talking about before? Yes. Yeah, so I don't know if you get a good Oh, one. there it is. Yes, I remember that uh, very fondly. I remember the day that was captured, even. It was yeah. Yeah. memorable, very memorable. So we are really wanting to support you guys as winemakers. Many of us here, including myself, we all are winos. We love a good good wine. And um, so how do we get your wine and where, how do we get on your list and get the monthly or whatever you guys offer there? Right. So we'd encourage you and your viewers to visit hillfamilyestate.com. Pretty easy to remember hillfamilyestate.com. And from there you can purchase a mixed case to send to yourself, or you can join our, our club where you get a quarterly shipment of wines that we select for you. I think we have a white club, we have a red club, um, but the club is just such a fun way to taste through all of the different wines that Doug was mentioning before and figure out what you'd like um, before maybe you want to purchase a, a case of something to have in your cellar. So um, anything folks can do to support uh, winemakers and um, people who are on their own side of the creative process right now is just so welcome. So we really appreciate your, your mentioning that, Ruth Ann. Yes, we'll definitely do that. For everyone in San Diego, too, you know, we, we joint ventured with Kyle Knox, a professional surfer from um, the San Diego area there. And we make a wine called Barrel Blend that is somewhat widely distributed through San Diego as well. Sure. So that one doesn't have our regular Hill family label. It's got uh, Kyle, a new a new photograph of Kyle surfing. He's in the barrel of a oh, wave. Yeah. And okay. And is, that's your son, right? No, no. A, a good friend, he ended up, uh, he had ended up marrying someone that my son had taken to prom up here in Napa. Okay. And so that was the connection. We got together okay. with him. He loved wine, traveled all over the world. And now what's he doing? He actually has his own little uh, brokerage and he's right. distributing our wine and, and other. Oh, that's great. So true. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, that's great. And I love how you guys, um, one of the things when I was up there, you know, you have such a hospitality and, you know, your your title is perfect because you do feel like family. I know I definitely felt that way. And do you still have the tasting room? So when people are back out, they can when they're up in Napa, they can come visit you guys. Absolutely. We do have it. And we will be offering another hosting adventure over at our new little winery site as well, which is only a mile south of Yonkville. So that's a little more a country experience, the little winery, uh, vineyard, and beautiful views, and being able to do some things outdoors. Yeah, it's just gorgeous. I can't wait. My Great. mouth is getting salivated as I'm thinking about the experience. <laughs> <laughs> you know, you're, you're talking, we have so many connections with San Diego because my son, of course, had worked there at George's at the Cove and uh, down at 910 Restaurant in, in La Jolla. Uh, both my my son and my daughter married. Um, their spouses are from Encinitas and Carlsbad. Carlsbad, yeah. and so we we have so many connections down that way. It's pretty incredible. Yeah. We might just have to open a tasting room here in San Diego. <laughs> Bring the wine to you. That could be fun. It could be. Well, thank you guys so much for what you do and for blessing so many people with your passion. Um, you know, there's a lot of winemakers out there, but there's few that are really family that have really grown your whole business out of just this passion of bringing things right out of the ground. And you guys work so hard. Your work ethic is amazing. And I know that anybody who tastes your wine is going to taste that love that you put in there. Oh, thank you so much. It, thank you. It's more a hobby, but it's one that occupies about 18 hours a day. <laughs> <laughs> I can relate with that a little bit. <laughs>
Yeah, art and wine, they're those two of those things that, you know, it, it so enriches your life. You couldn't really live without it. Right. But it is probably not, if you're going to just be in business, it's probably not the best economic choice, but it will surpass like your guys, your legacy will surpass you and my legacy will surpass me and just um, doing things that we really are passionate about and sharing that with other people. You can't put a price tag on that. So true. Stay, stay with your heart and you will be happy. Yeah. That's it. Yes. Well, I appreciate you guys being on and um, I just highly recommend folks out there get some of this wine. You will not be, you will be completely blown away and you will not be disappointed on any of their vintage, but I would have to give the plug for their Merlot, even though sideways didn't like it. Oh, well, too bad. I still love it. <laughs> Thank you. All right, you guys be well, and I'll be up there as soon as I can. As soon as this lifts. Fantastic. Looking forward right. to seeing you. you okay. Be blessed. Okay. Bye-bye. Bye now. All right. That was so fun. Those guys are awesome. If you folks get a chance, um, I know that's one thing I definitely will be doing is another road trip. I may not be jumping on the cruise ship anytime soon, but a trip up to Napa Valley would be so wonderful. And if any of you, I know some of you have been up there, they're in Yontville, which is um, right next to you know Napa itself. And they have the most charming tasting room. It's just a delight to go to. And just the most welcoming people, you guys would absolutely love it. So put that on your hit list. And the next person I'm bringing on the show today is Chad Awalt. Chad, I met at a for another gallery owner's uh, gallery, and then I brought it into our gallery here. And we're hoping to have a show for him um, probably at the end of the summer once all of this lifts, if he has the time, because I know he's going to be super busy. But he is one of those rare artists that are working in wood. It's kind of somewhat of a lost art. It was something that, you know, as you know, I'm Native American. There's still many of the tribes that practice this. But what Chad is doing is he's creating figurative work out of wood. And I'm going to let him share the process and how he does it. But if you've seen it in our gallery, it's breathtaking. And not only is it the shape that he captures, but it's also the wood that he chooses because the wood itself really plays an important role in the actual finish of the sculpture and of the, um, of the shape of the wood. So I'm going to bring him on and he is live streaming here from Georgia. So let's see if we can get Chad on the screen here. And there he is. Hi, Chad. Welcome to the show. All right. Am I coming through all right? You came through great. Your picture looks great. How are you doing there? I'm doing good. We're, we're surviving. <laughs> yeah. So tell the folks how it's been for you. I know that um, we chatted a little bit yesterday and that, you know, you, like most of the artists we bring on the show, you're used to having your own space and your studio, but probably not used to having everybody in your family there too, right? Right, right. Um, the, the timing of this, you know, when it started, uh, literally was working hard. My biggest event of the year is in May at, at Bindings Gallery here in Georgia. Um, and it's just a really large solo show that I just it's a, this one I go all out for every year to have as many new pieces as possible to introduce at one time. And, um, and fortunately, since I'm getting ready for that, I actually have some finished pieces here for the broadcast. Oh, I good. Usually out the door to galleries and I have stuff in progress all the time, but we get the, the treat of seeing some finished work here on the, on the broadcast here. So, well, um, before you, you show us and do the big reveal, why don't you share with the folks your process, because I remember talking to you in Atlanta about how you collect these wood stumps, basically, and then kind of let them sit around until they age. Tell us how, what's the process of you from the beginning to the end of creating these? Um, like the initial stage is, you know, I do a study, like people, uh, uh, the question I always get is like, did I find a log shaped like a person that inspired me? It's like... <laughs> No, they're all just big round logs. They're all the same same shape. All right. I do a study so I know 
uh, what I'm going to do with design wise uh, beforehand. That's like I do. I'll do like a body cast with the model, and I have it as a reference, and I match that up. What my my objective is when I'm wor working with the wood. What inspires me is the patterns that I get to work with. And there's a certain amount that's revealed on the outside of the log, like you can see at the end of the log or just markings on the outside. You know there's going to be some distress and unusual patterns. And I'll try to line those up so that they you know, complement the form as much as possible. Uh, yeah, you, I try to line it up so that these beautiful lines will fall in interesting ways on the sculpture, you know, so. Um, right. That's using my design goals, not that, that, and that's what I, when I see something in the log, it's the patterns, and I tried my best to start on the side of the log that that'll be incorporated in the piece. Um, so that's, that's the initial step is just doing the study and finding the material that, uh, and I, and it's like, I, it's a best guess. I, I kind of know from experience what a pattern will do, but obviously, every time it's a surprise like sometimes it's like i expect it to be spectacular and it's okay it's a pretty one and there's other times you know you cut into the wood and you're just oh my god that's the prettiest thing i've ever seen you know it's just the, the, and that's the joy of wood is every that's piece so of cool and doing this for 30 years and i still get surprised i still cut into a piece of wood and just like oh i had no idea that's beautiful <laughs> You know, do you have the, um, you know, the, the logs laying around and then you just look at one and go, okay, you, you're up next. Yeah. Well, I, yeah. No. <laughs> uh, Cause I have a pretty good idea. Yeah. They, um, you all accumulate wood. I keep an eye out. Like I, I can't just go out in the, the day I need a log and find a log. Yeah. I just cut when, um, something comes available, I see a tree service truck with a maple cutting down a maple tree or something, you know, I'll stop and talk to the people and, uh, uh, and look and see if the wood has any unique markings and stuff. And I try to collect it when I can, when it's available. Or I also have friends call me. I, we lost a tree in our neighborhood. <laughs> it came down in the storm, you know. Um, so anyway, it's... Uh, I, That's I, great. That, yeah. And it's great that you're reappropriating, you know, the trees and turning them into something that will be here forever. Yeah. So I got an idea of kind of what logs I have out there. And when I'm doing certain pieces, I'll have something in mind like, oh, that one big piece out there would be spectacular for this and, um, and most of the time it kind of works out that way but, but a lot of times i'll literally have my pattern <coughs> excuse me and you know go out and be just looking at all the different logs and the pattern and trying to figure out which one you know so it literally sometimes it's out trying to match up and make a decision um, I, but i have always have a good idea what my inventory of logs are there they're all around my studio out in the backyard. <laughs> That's great. Well, I'm going to minimize my screen so we can take a little look, see at what you've got there. And these are all pieces you've been working on for your upcoming show, right? Okay. Yeah. Um, uh, my son's going to help me with the camera here. His, his, name, it's funny, his name's Kyle. <laughs> After no worries. About, about their, their friend Kyle. Um, right. Okay. So I'm going to switch it here. All right. Um, so the, the work I've done in the past has always been, you know, just incorporating the beautiful patterns in the wood and the grain. And this year I've started a new technique, incorporating the colored resin with the work. And everybody is really excited about this. So um, it's That is spectacular. How do you do that? I've never seen that one before. That's really hard to explain because it's not easy to, it's very difficult to do. Uh, but the, the resin is cast, you know, it's, a, it's in liquid form and I have to make a mold and cast it and bond it to the wood. Uh, so, but it's, it's been kind of nice doing something really kind of dramatically new in this time with stressed out as we, stressed out as we are about the, um, you know, everything that's going on. You know, it's nice that there's something unique about my show. You know, it just, it just emotionally, it kind of helps me have something to kind of strive for that's new and a challenge. You know, this this one here was a challenge. Uh, these simpler ones aren't quite as difficult. This was by far, you know, obviously the most difficult one. But the beautiful accents that the, the resin can make are really, really pretty. And this one's more subtle. You can't see it as well in the video probably. But that's just like inlaid with gold down in the resin. Oh, that's stunning. Yeah, 
the, this one's a little more subtle. But the wood pattern is already so spectacular with this. I thought just the gold would be really special on that. Um, yeah, maybe blue. turn one, Chad, so we can see the, um, you know, the three-dimensional view. Because I believe that the fronts are beautiful, but the backs are also just so amazing. I mean, that's the beauty of your work is that you really want to view it from every angle because each angle, the precision and just the movement, it, it's just, um, I've never seen another artist be able to capture what you're doing here. I love this, this hole went clear through. So I got a little accent on the back of it too. And, uh, you know, when I first started doing these, I, you know, I love the torso concept, but you know, the heavy solid, just like arms missing one. They, to me, they felt like heavy, like artifacts and fragments. And I, I still wanted the lightness and life. And that's why I started, you know, developed this form of it being almost hollowed out. Because with these lines and stuff, I can get all this energy with the negative space. That kind of brings these things to life. You know, they don't, they don't feel like old, broken, missing parts. You know, it's, it, it's like the energy is there that your mind finishes the rest of the piece. Like you, almost like when you see a black and white photograph that just has a part of the body accent and you know the whole person's there you, you kind of with these you kind of visualize i feel like the whole emotion of the person with it they, you know because of that energy that kind of brings them to life agreed and i love that i love that new um resin that you're putting there because the color is really has a really interesting contrast to the wood what's nice too is it's a really the the pigment um the iridescent part of it is done with mica, and it's a really fine mica powder. So it has just a really deep, natural, iridescent look to it. You know, instead of just being kind of a glitter or something, you know, yeah. uh, the mica has a really just beautiful shimmer to it. it you know, almost when you rock on the ground, it has a bit of mica in it and it catches the sun. Right. That's how this is. It just it just illuminates pretty without looking like it's sparkly, you know. Um, so... So are you using, I know you had said when I spoke to you, you start with a, a saw. Is that how you start? And then you start using hand tools or what is your process on these? I'll show you out here. I have, um, we're going outside, so hopefully our, our signal keeps working. Oh, that's great. Look at all that wood. Here we go, folks. We get to see these guys come alive. Here's the logs in my mess. And here's some pieces in progress. You'll see it's almost a whole log that hasn't been hollowed out yet. That still has all the shape of the log to it. Um, I actually start with a chain, hydraulic chainsaw. Hey, speak up. Oh, some of the early stages, I start with a chainsaw just to have so much material to remove. And then you know, I start using just smaller grinders and stuff for doing some of the shaping. So, um, and I built this area. I built this area out here to, because this is the biggest, messiest part that I do. Um, it's it's kind of nice to be able to be out here and uh, work outside and kind of keep the clutter and mess of the the big, the, the heaviest sawdust part outside. Um, so that's where you do the, you really start removing the larger pieces of the wood and then it starts getting more refined and you yeah. use tools that are more refined? Yeah. And then I'm Got inside it. where you get a better reception now. <laughs> um, Hang on. There. Got it? Mm, cutting it out. We see, we're seeing you. We're following along. She's talking. I can't hear. Okay, we might need to hang up and call back. Come I can back. hear you yeah, guys. I'm going to exit and come back real quick, okay? 
Okay, no problem. I was kind of wondering when we were going to have that. Our last broadcast was amazing because we didn't have one cut out the entire time. So, you know, I think more people might be on the internet right now. But isn't it incredible to see how many artists we've had on the show in the last few weeks? And each one of them, you know, are equally amazing in their own way. But it's always interesting being having been in the arts watching how these artists evolve into their own style. Like for instance, Chad's sculpture, I've never seen another sculptor that does what he does. Although there are other wood sculptors out there, his style is so unique to himself and that is his fingerprint that he's putting on there. Can you hear me now, Chad? That's okay. It happens. Sometimes the sound goes out. It's usually just a lost signal, but, but let me, we were intrigued. Let me see if I can get you back in the stream here. Okay. Okay. You're back. Okay. I'm uh, going to minimize my screen again because we were so enjoying your work there. There we go. Okay. All right. So after, you know, dealing with working with the bigger saws and doing a lot of the initial shaping, then, you know, I work more at this workbench inside. And uh, um, <laughs> that over. anyway, I use tools like this that do sanding, and I have different kinds of sanders that go on this for you know coarseness. And is done with the. Um, this is a nice tool, really nice tool. It's a heavy duty German tool that um, it has just enough power and things that I can literally do the, the final sculpting with this. Um, and then I also, there's a certain amount that will be done with, with hand tools and stuff too. These, these sharper lines have to be done with the chisel. So at this stage, it's, between, it's more with the hand tools and um, a, like I say, a lot of sanding, <laughs> a lot of sanding. That looks like a workout. Yeah, it is. It's, you know, I'll put the headphones on and binge watch a TV show or listen to a ball game or a podcast or something, um, some music. And because like, it'll just be, you know, hours of sanding. It's like, I, you know, a, a piece like this, I'll, you know, I'll literally be sanding it for two days. Um, so you kind of need to kind of get something in your head to, to otherwise you're spend too, too long just thinking with your thoughts. <laughs> But uh, the sanding is just kind of more of a, almost a Zen process. You just get in and just keep watching it develop and um, you see the surface develop. It's interesting, you know, I was just sharing with the viewer earlier, your, your style is so unique, but it's interesting to see the process because the way that you go about creating these is so meticulous it's time consuming and it really takes a certain personality to have that patience to create something like this yeah it's um you know a lot of people that say i'm like really patient and i'm like, like and i'm i'm really not it's more just kind of obsessed it's like I, I don't ever think of if i stopped and thought about it, i'm going to be sanding this for 20 hours it's like it's kind of depressing and that it gets you anxious I, I usually just take it a step at a time. I'm like, you know, I need, you know, I want to do this step. You know, I'm just thinking about that hour, and I like, I knew I need to do this step, and I'm focusing on that. And in my mind, it's always broken down into steps. So, but, but once in a while, I step, I sit back and I think about how much I have to do to like get ready for a show and how soon it's coming up. And you know, it kind of makes you like a knot in your stomach. You know? I'm then, sure. You put that out of your mind and you start doing your steps and your process and it all comes together. So <laughs> well, it's absolutely incredible. The finished work is amazing. And even watching the process, do you have anyone in your family or do you have anyone who you'll be able to pass the baton on to? Because this would seem like it's something that you're really going to have to find someone who is as committed and as patient as you are just because of process besides being so skilled at it well, just that have, devotion to the process i would think the, that's a unique person my kids have the talent but they have other interests so they, they need to follow their hearts <laughs> right yeah well you know that you, you, 
or she, you know, it's like she's she's a very good artist, but uh, you met her working at the gallery. Um, they say we were talking about her yesterday. Her mind is always more design and coordinating and bringing things together and and bringing people together with art. Even though she's very good at she, it, when she sits down and decides she wants to paint, so she, she's just incredibly talented. But her but your passion has to be there to do it. Like we just talked about how many hours it takes. Um, you just have to have a passion to want to spend that kind of time, you know, driven to have to do it. And like, her, like her desires are more design than my other two. They like, they're always busy doing stuff, but their, their passions are in science. So, uh, one of my other daughters is, uh, in pharmacy school right now. My son graduated with uh, a science and biology degree. And, um, so it's like, say every, everybody has to kind of do what speaks to them. <laughs> right. Well, it's interesting that you, you know, that your kids are, you know, leaning at least two of them towards more of the science, because I can see that in your artwork, in what you're creating, there is quite a bit of really, you have to have a very strong reasoning sensibility when you're cutting into the wood, because it's, um, it's final. Once you make those cuts, um, you have to continue on with the process. Yeah. It's, you have to be very committed. Exactly. Um, yeah, it's, it's your mistakes. Yeah, it's, there's, with abstracts, have a little bit more forgiveness because I'm making shapes. But when you're doing a figurative form, um, yeah, once you make a cut that doesn't follow human anatomy, uh, it's really. <laughs> <laughs> really be focused on when I get to that stage of the piece is like, you know, not, not rush it and cut too far in an area where I needed the material, you know? <laughs> right. Well, my, I wanted to ask you also a question. Why did you decide to work in wood? Um, kind of wasn't a decision. I just, it, it's like one of those things I always was around it. Um, I grew up around wood. Like my dad had a shop, um, you know, it just, I, I can't remember there never being, um, you know, not having tools around to use and be able to make something out of wood. So, um, and uh, my grandfather did some carving. It was more like whittling and stuff. And I just developed an interest in carving. And you can see some of the stuff around here. I used to do furniture, uh, classical furniture because I love, let me show you a couple patterns up there. Um, you know, I love doing the, uh, just carving and shaping wood. Um, and about 25 years ago, I was a conversation with a gallery. I was just describing these pieces and like, I wanted to do something that wasn't functional art with the furniture. Um, and we decided to just do a group of them and they were real, they were real successful and we're just like, well, we need to do more of these. And, and it took off from there, but yeah, I didn't set it like, I never got out this like, what can I do that's different? It's like wood was just what I really understood and know, you know, so it's one of those things that evolved because it's part of me. It's like who I am. Um, right. I, I see the world three dimensionally. Like, I feel like I would have a hard time teaching sculpture because um, it, it was hard for me to even value my work when I first started carving because it, it's this I don't mean to sound this arrogant but it just seems easy to me I just see things three-dimensionally so as far as you know I didn't really have to learn how to car work with the wood but I had to learn was design like um, people are like how do you learn how to carve or just like I just started doing it um, but my early designs were you know so embarrassing my mother wouldn't hang them up you know so <laughs> <laughs> But, uh, More than I could do, that's for sure. It took me time to learn how to make things beautiful and express with feelings of how I saw things. So that that's where my efforts were in. Like we're actually studying design, and um, actually, like studying painting really helped me improve my sculptures. Just because the person I was studying painting with um, just really understood the psychology of how people view things, and mm -hmm. uh, I just kind of did it as a side thing. My daughters like to paint. I thought, oh, I just have a painting in the house and that'll be a nice thing for them to grow up around. And I didn't realize like it, it it's all tied together. Everything with design, doesn't matter with what medium or decorating or painting or sculpting, music. It's just like that idea of being able to, you know, 
with your media and be able to connect with people and make them feel what you feel emotionally. Um, yeah, that's, that's just like it. And you never totally mastered that. I, I, I know people love my work, but every day I feel like I learned something. So it's like, that's it, like, I, I'm, I'm a ways before I ever get bored with this yet because it's still exciting. Well, and, that, and I think what you're saying is the reason people feel that emotion, but I think you, you touched upon something that a lot of people who have not ever created art or have been intimately involved in the art creation, like working with artists or having artists in the family is that it's really, um, it's really a matter of problem solving. So part of it is that fluid creativity, but the other part is very much thinking about how something's going to work within a certain amount of space and whether it's music or whether it's design, that definitely is the challenging portion is how do I make this work? So on the other side, it does feel seamless. And a lot of times it is, but most times there is a somewhat of a struggle there to create. Yeah. And I always find too, like, like uh, something I learned over the years, like initially, you, you know, as an artist, when you're first starting, you think, oh, I have to be really skilled for this to be good and people like it. And I realized like, you know, after, you know, being in the business for a long time and seeing clients and what that, um, you know, people don't buy artwork as a product. It's more of an emotion and a memory. Like yeah. they, they, they have a piece of art in their house because it either means something to them or it evokes a memory or such. And it's something they always want to have, you know, it's almost like their photo album. Like you're not going to throw out your photo album. Right. It can be it's, the true. it's something that connects with them. That's a feeling that they want to have in their life, you know, and it, and, it really helped to understand that, you know, as the final step in design is, um, okay, how do I, you know, I have those feelings when I'm, when I'm approaching this, like why I'm excited about it. How do I convey that and help somebody else connect and they feel that too. So uh, anyway, it's. Uh, well, I'd say it's easy to do with your work for sure. Thank you. <laughs> It's very easy because one, you're creating figurative work. And I think we already, uh, you know, especially right now, we really have, um, you know, realized how important the human connection is. Right. And then, I mean, they're just breathtaking is all I can say. You know, everybody who has come to come into the gallery when we have your work up is stops and admires it because it's, um, just something that is so eye-catching is all I can say. People love your work. So I really appreciate you being on the show, Chad, and I'm hoping we can get you out here to San Diego to do a show in the gallery at some point. Oh, I'm sure we're, we'll, we'll talk about it. <laughs> yeah, it would be really great. I know you're probably overwhelmed right now with, you know, the fact that you've not had any shows and now I'm, everybody's going to be after you to do a show, but um, we'd like to be on the list if possible. Yeah, definitely, definitely can. Um, and I, I just, uh, as soon as you get a minute, give me a call and we can talk about that. <laughs> yes, I definitely will. I've got a few minutes these days, but um, hopefully that doesn't last long because they are talking about letting us open up the gallery, you know, probably with our masks and social distancing, but I can't wait. <laughs> I'm very excited. Yeah, it's, you, you don't realize it, it's, it, like I say, it's made us really appreciate that how much we do need the human connection. Um, love my family, but I think they're we're all getting one minute just to look at somebody else for a second. <laughs> they're rolling his eyes at me a little bit. <laughs> that is so true. Just ask my 13 year old. She'll tell you the same thing. That is really true. Well, Chad, be blessed. Blessings to your family and uh, to your cameraman there. We really appreciate you sharing your artwork with us. And folks, I put his uh, website. Take a look if you would like to see more of his work. Um, every single piece is an original, so there are no two alike, and they are all equally just so, I'd say breathtaking would be the word. Um, there's, there's not another artist that I've seen that creates what you create, Chad, so... We really appreciate what you bring to the to the world of art. Well, I appreciate your efforts out there and 
we, we couldn't do it without people like you. Um, nobody would find me here hiding in my studio. So you, you, you are as appreci much appreciated as well. well. Thank you. I appreciate that. All right. Well, we will see you again. Be well. I hope your show goes well in Atlanta and I will definitely reach out to you and we'll get a show booked here. Sounds good. Okay, Chad. Talk All to right. you again soon. Okay. Bye. Okay, bye. Okay, folks, so that is our Monday. We're well on our way. Cross your fingers. I listened to um, our governor today talk about the possibility of letting us open up as soon as this Friday with obviously with limitations. So I'm trying not to get my hopes up too much and um, because I'd love to see you guys, but I will tell you that as soon as we can open, even if it's limited contact, we are gonna have champagne here flowing, free flowing, because we really need to celebrate that we've all been able to get through this. So join us on Wednesday. We're gonna have Fabio Napoleoni here. And then on Friday, we have a special guest. We're leading up to Mother's Day, so you probably have a little bit of a hint who might be on the show on Friday. But I appreciate you viewing in. Please share the links. Again, check out our uh, YouTube channel. Art of the City TV. Not only do we have these live streaming shows, but we also have the um, Art of the City San Diego that I posted from my project going into some of the most important artists and cities starting here in San Diego. And then pretty soon I'll have the Santa Fe ones up and then New Orleans. So uh, be blessed. I'm so happy that you guys tune in. I appreciate all your comments here. Can't wait to see them. And I'll see you on Wednesday, 1 p.m., Art of the City TV live streaming on Facebook. Be well, folks.